All right, everybody, make sure you have your note sheets ready. Uh, what we're taking a look at is American expansionism in Latin America. Ultimately, by the end of this lecture, what we want you to be able to answer is what actions did the United States take to achieve its goals in Latin America? What I mean by goals are the motives that we've been talking about. So is this dealing with national honor, uh, economic issues or commerce, racial superiority, or even altruism, doing things for what we thought to be uh, beneficial to those that we were um, expanding into their lands. So just uh, as an overview before we get into everything, so we know that as the United States was asserting itself and its interest in East Asia, such as the Philippines, we were calling for more aggressive roles in Latin America. This is obviously being within our nation's backyard. Latin America brings uh, some obvious economic and political benefits that we'll get into. Now, Latin America is comprised of, of four areas. It would be Mexico, Central America, uh, South America, as well as the Caribbean. So we'll touch on some of those locations. First thing I want to hit on is Cuba and Puerto Rico. So going back to when we talked about the Spanish-American War, our victory in that conflict over Spain liberated Puerto Rican and Cuban people from Spanish rule. However, it left their fate unresolved. Should they be independent or should they be colonies of the United States? Uh, so we know that the Treaty of Paris, as it says here, um, is obviously Spain giving us control of Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico, and then obviously the other place we've mentioned, the uh, West Indies, Guam, and the Philippines. Now the first issue that will come to be regarding these two locations, let's start with uh, Puerto Rico, will be something called the Four Acre Act. Now in 1900, when the Four Acre Act was passed, what it helped to establish was a civil government in Puerto Rico. What this allowed the Puerto Rican people to do, I'm sorry, the president to do, is to appoint a governor for the Puerto Ricans, but allow the Puerto Rican people to elect their own representatives. Uh, eventually, Puerto Ricans would be given many of the same citizenship rights that the Americans enjoy today. Uh, when we take a look at Cuba, you know, as stated in previous lectures, uh, the, the Platt Amendment was added to the Cuban Constitution in 1902. What this amendment required Cuba to do is to lease naval stations or land for naval stations to the United States, and it granted the United States the right to intervene in situations to preserve order in Cuba. So as to why we have military bases such as Guantanamo Bay in Cuba today, it dates back to the Platt Amendment. So while Cubans were strongly opposed to the Platt Amendment, they realized that America would not end its military governing of the island. Therefore, the treaty uh, would make... Cuba, a protectorate of the United States for decades. Going forward, we're going to take a look at Teddy Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy. Um, so upon assuming the presidency, we know that Roosevelt, a avid imperialist, uh, promoted a type of diplomacy that required America to accept its role of international leadership. And in order to do this, Roosevelt felt that a strong military buildup to demonstrate that might would be necessary. And this came to be known as his big stick diplomacy or big stick policy. And it came um, from a quote that uh, went by, speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. Now a good demonstration of this is that something that we come to know as the Great White Fleet. Uh, what essentially this was is that uh, when Roosevelt sent a, a series of 16 battleships of the Atlantic fleet and a uh, voyage to circumnavigate the globe that roughly took about two years. It came to be known as the Great White Fleet because the battleships were painted white, hence the name. Uh, so this voyage was obviously a pageant around um, the world. Um, the squadron were manned by 14,000 sailors. It covered some 43,000 miles and it made different uh, calls upon uh, 20 ports on six continents. The big issue with this is it allowed the United States to show its military muscle that we were developing a strong navy. Um, when we talk about the Monroe Doctrine, we've mentioned this before um, in 1823 uh, when the Monroe Doctrine was created, the intent was to prevent European colonization in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, with a potential threat to the original doctrine, what Teddy Roosevelt did was to issue what he called to be the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Um, so as many 
what was going on at this point in time is that as many Latin American nations were unable to pay debts to foreign investors, mainly European countries, we felt that uh, many of these European countries would intervene and cause us to have to enforce this Monroe Doctrine. But going back to the Roosevelt corollary to it, um, in an effort to prevent inter European intervention in Latin American countries, Roosevelt said that the United States was justified in acting against potential threats to the Monroe Doctrine. Um, so this would allow us to intervene in these countries in order to protect anything within the Western Hemisphere. Um, this would eventually be uh, modified slightly, I guess we could say. Um, or Roosevelt would lay the foundation for what William Howard Taft would later do in that he continued to expand the policy and he started this in Central America where he called it dollar diplomacy. And the aim of dollar diplomacy, as we can see in this chart right here, was to encourage Americans to invest in Latin America. Um, it was a policy aimed at furthering our interest there by encouraging investment in foreign countries. Uh, but we also felt obligated to uphold and um, economically and the political stability of other countries. Uh, Taft's dollar diplomacy did not just allow the United States to gain financially from other countries, but it uh, prevented other foreign countries, European countries mainly, from getting any sort of financial gain. So consequentially, when the United States benefited from these Latin American countries, other world powers would not. So overall, dollar diplomacy was used to protect trade within Latin America and Asia for the United States. Panama. So Panama's got a unique location. Um, as I kind of scroll right over it, you see where it says Panama Canal, but um, in the southernmost portion of Central America, um, it was a prime destination to build a canal that would shorten the distance between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Um, so you can see the, the pathway there and the distance that uh, a canal would cut as opposed to having to go all the way around the southernmost tip of South America to get from the east coast to the west coast of the United States. So this task was originally undertaken by a French company in the 1800s, but due to various reasons, it failed. Uh, the task would be picked up by the United States government in 1903, where we purchased that same route for $40 million. However, the difficulty in starting this process was that Panama um, was uh, loosely affiliated with the country of Colombia and Colombia had made demands to the United States that we were not willing to commit in order to obtain this canal route so it became a very difficult process in order to legitimately start building the canal. Um, Panama would eventually declare its independence from Colombia and the new Panamanian government would give the United States control over the canal route in exchange for $10 million and an annual rent of $250,000. So this, the money wasn't the factor, but the bigger issue is the controversy behind it. Now, in explaining this political cartoon that you see right here, um, it deals with the situation which is oftentimes viewed as controversial uh, as to how we received the land itself. Uh, the man in the black suit and the mustache would be a, uh, I guess we could say a Panamanian representative. His name is uh, Felipe Bunau Varia. I'll spell that out for you in class. Um, but in a famous quote, um, he said that he called upon uh, Mr. Roosevelt and asked him point blank if the revolt broke out, meaning the Panamanian people break out for their independence against Colombia. An American warship would be sent to Panama to, quote, protect American lives and interests. The president looked at me and said nothing. Of course, the President of the United States could not give such a commitment, especially to a foreigner or private citizen like me, but his look was enough for me. I took the gamble. Hence where we see the intrigue. So this would be the uh, Panamanian people rising up against Colombia, and then you see this egg pop out, which would be Panama, and then uh, obviously it's permission that would be given to the United States to begin digging it. Now the, the part that was left out of it is that American warships were actually sent to um, the area where the rebellion would break out in support of the Panamanian people against Colombia, obviously for our interest to build that canal. Um, so just some pictures of, of what the building of the Panama Canal looked like. It was a laborious process. Um, it took over 10 years to complete and it would eventually cut some 8,000 miles off the trip from the west coast to the east coast and vice versa, but it came at an extremely high cost. 
going through some tropical areas. Um, over four, I'm sorry, 5,000 canal workers died from disease and accidents while building the canal. And as we can see in this image, Teddy Roosevelt himself was actually uh, sitting on one of the uh, pieces of machinery to help dig a little bit, probably more for publicity than anything. Um, but as you can see from this map where the Panama Canal actually goes, um, it is really an impressive um, development within the 20th century that we'll take a look at a little bit further in class. Um, it is a series of locks that raises and lowers water levels to allow uh, vessels to flow through and um, it really it is impressive in terms of how it works and how it allows uh, the ships to move through this area. Um, it was kind of an interesting situation that when Jimmy Carter was president in uh, 1977 that he signed the Panama Canal Treaty um, which handed control over the Panama Canal back to the Panamanian people on uh, December 31st, 1999 at 11.59 p.m. So if you think about how many times you've maybe taken a shortcut through your neighbor's backyard, obviously we can still do that, but it is no longer under control, but under Panama's control. So as we conclude taking a look at American imperialism, I want you to finish by taking a look at this map of 1906, which shows the American Empire. So areas that are either a darker brown or are boxed demonstrate places where America became heavily involved um, in one way or another, but obviously referring back to those motives. There's definitely a motive for being uh, going to the locations that you see on this map.